Srila Rupa Goswami. Srila Rupa Goswami, one of the leaders of the Goswamis in Vrindavan, who were all followers of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So, actually, we often say a prayer. Uh, after we say Om Mabhyana Tabarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Unmilita Nyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manubhistam Sapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadam So after we offer our respects to our spiritual teacher, we then offer that prayer to Srila Rupa Goswami. Uh, the meaning, of course, is that when will Srila Rupa Goswami, who is established in this mission, and who is established in this world, the mission to fulfill the desire of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, give me shelter at his lotus feet. So we pray to Rupa Goswami in that way. We want to get shelter at his lotus feet. Srila Rupa Goswami was the direct disciple of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He and his brother, his elder brother, Sanatana Goswami, were both direct disciples of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And they met Lord Chaitanya, first of all, at a place called Ramakeli in Bengal. Very beautiful place. If you get the opportunity, you must go and see Ramakeli. It's a very wonderful place. You know, Vrindavan has become so crowded and so commercial. It's not the way it used to be. But if you go to Ramakeli, you can you get some idea of what Vrindavan was like many many years ago. It's much, it's very peaceful and quiet. And everywhere you see people bringing a herd of cows by. So many cow, little groups of cows are moving around, and, and it's very green and, and nice trees are there. It's a very very transcendental place. Rupa Goswami and Sanatana Goswami, probably most of you know, that they were originally in the service of the Nawab Hussein Shah. The Nawab Hussein Shah is a very big man in history. Rupa and Sanatana are not so big in history, but Nawab Hussein Shah is very big in terms of, you know, what we call history. And even Western historians, they come there today, they will come to visit Ramakali just to check out the ruins of the Nawab Hussein Shah. The Nawab Hussein Shah was ruling the whole of Bengal. Bengal means Bangladesh as well as West Bengal, which is part of India today. So he was a very powerful man and he had quite an empire. And he was even challenging the uh, Maharaj Prataparudra and Utkal and his empire, Utkal. Anyway, Rupa and Sanatan at that time, they were initially in the service of the Nawab Hussein Shah. They were born in Orthodox Brahmana family. They actually had come from Karnataka and somehow their father had moved up to Bengal and settled at Ramakali. And Rupa and Sanatan were very prominent among the Brahmana community. And the Nawab engaged them in his service. And he gave them very big positions in his government. One was the Prime Minister and one was the Chancellor of the Exchequer. And he gave them also names, Mohammedan names. Dabir Khas and Sakara Mal were their names. And this way they were living there in Ramakali. But 
while they were living there, they were in the mode of serving Krishna. And they, they were planning how to make Ramakali into another Vrindavan. And they had different kuns excavated and they named them. You know, one was Radhakun, Lalitakun, Chamakun, Kishakakun. There's so many different kuns are there after the names of the different gopis. And so, uh, you can see also Sanatana Goswami's deity, uh, some deities which he was worshipping there before he moved to Vrindavan. And the footprints of Lord Chaitanya are there, established by Bhakti Siddhanta and Sarasati Prabhupada. So, Rupa and Sanatana were living there in Ramakali and they were serving the Nawab, but they were getting news about Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's activities. How Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had, well, first of all, as a young man, he had uh, defeated Keshava Kashmiri, who was Digvijay, who was traveling all over India, challenging people to debates and how he had come to Navadweep and all the pundits were afraid of him. But at that time Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was known as Nimai Pandit and he had a small group of students who were studying under him. And he met Keshava Kashmiri and Lord Chaitanya defeated him in debate. So that, that was big news, Lord Chaitanya, was, he was only a young teenage boy at the time. And then of course Nimai Pandit went on to lead the civil disobedience movement against the Chankazi. And the Chankazi then gave permission for Sankirtan to continue. That he said, never again will any of my, will, and will I or any of my descendants ever interfere with the Sankirtan movement. And Prabhupada said, even in the time of the partition, where there was great tension between Hindu and Muslim, at that, that time the, the, the Muslim people did not try to interfere with the Sankirtan movement. They kept the Chankazis pledge, which he had made hundreds of years earlier. So there was, there was big news. And then of course, Nimai Pandit had taken sannyas at the age of 24, and he'd gone to live in, he'd gone to Jagannath Puri, and he'd converted Sarvabhama Bhattacharya. From a logician, he'd made him into a devotee. So it was, again, it was big news. And it was spreading all over. Everyone was hearing about this Nimai Pandit. He's become Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And he's converted Sarva Bhoma Bhattacharya into a Vaishnava. And he's joined the Hare Krishna movement. So, Rupa and Sanatan, Dabir Kas, Sakara Malik, they were hearing all of this and they were very attracted. They wanted to join Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. They wanted to have the opportunity to somehow meet him and to join with his and, and, and help him in his mission. So they wrote letters to Jagannath Puri. There was no email or mobile phones, of course. It was real snail mail, you know, somebody would carry the message personally and somehow it got delivered to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Jagannath Puri. And he received their letters and he could immediately understand these are very, very special people, they're very erudite, they're very well learned and they're very qualified to make great devotees. Although they had become of course, ostracized, kicked out of the Brahminical culture because he'd taken up service in the Mohammedan government. But Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu understood their potential. And Lord Chaitanya personally went to Ramakali. He was on his way to Vrindavan at the time. 
but he stopped off at Ramakili. Their first meeting with his first meeting with Rupa and Sanatan was there in Ramakili. There's a place near Ramakili called Kanai Natsala, which is also a very wonderful place. We have an Iskon temple there. We have it Ramakili also. We're developing the temple there, Ramakili anyway. It's a, you know, we have land and they're developing. So Lord Chaitanya went to Ramakili and he met with Rupa and Sanatana. At that time, many people were following Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And Rupa and Sanatana advised Lord Chaitanya. They told them, they said, oh, it's, it's not good for you to go to a holy place with so many people following you. It will not be very good. And they were also worried that it, because so many people were following Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, it may attract the attention of the Nawab. So they asked Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu uh, that, that please be careful, don't bring so many people, don't have so many people following you. So Lord Chaitanya, on their advice, he gave up going to Vrindavan at that particular time and went back to Jagannath Puri. Anyway, Rupa and Sanatan had that nice meeting with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and of course they came before Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. They were very humble. They fell on the ground with straw in their mouth in indicating submission to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And Rupa Goswami also recited his famous verse, Namo Maha Badanaya Krishna Prima Pradayati Krishnaya Krishna Namane Krishna That you are the most merciful of all of Krishna's incarnations because you are dis distributing freely love of God. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu encouraged Rupa and Sanatan. He told them, better you leave this job. <laughs> you know, that your job working in the service of the Nawab is not very good for your spiritual life. And it will be better if you get out from that job. And you can come and join me. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu then left Rupa and Sanatan and Rupa and Sanatan they had to make arrangements to get out of their positions. Rupa Goswami was first to get out. And our scripture Srila Prabhupada describes in the Nectar of Devotion how Rupa Goswami retired from his position and he had a, a, a great amount of wealth. It is said that when he retired, he had so much wealth it was filling a boat and he divided it in a very exemplary manner. He gave half of what, he, what wealth he had, he gave half to the service of the Vaishnavas and the Brahmanas. He gave 25% to his family and relatives and he kept 25% the balance, he kept that for his own emergency purposes. So Srila Prabhupada said this is a very, very good system, very good way to divide your wealth, you know. If you're thinking of retiring and you have a lot of wealth, you know, you can do, you can do like that, you know. You give half for the service of the Vaishnavas and the Brahmins. And you keep 25% for your event. So Rupa Goswami, he retired. That 25% which he kept for emergency, he actually left it with a, a storekeeper there in Ramakili. And Rupa Goswami then left Ramakili on his... He left his elder brother Sanatan there, 
Sanatan had greater responsibilities and he had to make arrangements for his retirement. But Rupa Goswami just left immediately. He left and he went to meet Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And they did. He met Lord Chaitanya. It was a triag where the Ganga meets the Yamuna. And there's a place there called the Das Ashwamedha Ghat. So Rupa Goswami met with Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu there. And Lord Chaitanya uh, received him and gave him instructions for 10 days. And he instructed him for 10 days on the science of devotional service. Particularly Rasa Tattva, the science of the mellows of transcendental love of God. You know, there's different rasas, Shantaras, Dashyaras, Sakyaras, Vatsauyaras, Madhuryaras. So Lord Chaitanya instructed Rupa Goswami in the nature of this rasa and different devotees, how different devotees are engaging in pastimes with Lord Krishna and these different rasas. There are five primary rasas and there are seven secondary rasas. So Lord Chaitanya gave a lot of instruction to Rupa Goswami about all of these things. And he requested Rupa Goswami to write books about these things. And he also requested Rupa Goswami that he said, I want you to go to Vrindavan and I want you to establish a place for the worship of Lord Krishna. Make some temple there and then show people how to properly worship the deity. And I want you also to excavate all the different places of Lord Krishna's pastimes. And Lord Chaitanya told Rupa Goswami, he said, Vrindavan is your Prabhadatta Desh. Prabhadatta Desh means the place which is given by the Master. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, I am giving this place, Vrindavan, to you and your brother. That I want you both to go there and stay in Vrindavan and develop develop the, the preaching there by establishing nice temples for worship of the deity and ex finding out all the different places of Lord Krishna's pastimes. So this was Lord Chaitanya's instruction to Srila Rupa Goswami. So Srila Rupa Goswami, after 10 days of association with Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, then he went to Vrindavan and he stayed there in Vrindavan and he began to follow, try to, try to fulfill all the instructions which Lord Chaitanya had given him. And he did. He did wonderful things. He wrote wonderful books about the pastimes of Lord Krishna, highlighting the nature of rasa and the different loving exchanges between Lord Krishna and his devotees. And he wrote about the technicalities of all of this rasa. One of the books, a very, very important and famous book which he wrote was the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, which Srila Prabhupada wrote a summary study of the book and Srila Prabhupada called the book The Nectar of Devotion. So actually this book, the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, this was mentioned to our own Srila Prabhupada by Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada. 
When our Srila Prabhupada went to get initiation from Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada, who knows what year was it when Prabhupada got initiation? 1933. And where? Hmm? Not Vrindavan. Prayagraj, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Prabhupada had his chemist business. He had a chemist business and he had a shop there in Al, it was called Al Hamba at that time. Only some few years ago they changed the name to Prayagraj. Anyway, Prabhupada's pharmacy was called Prayag Pharmacy. And he was doing his chemist business and he had met the devotees. He had met Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati earlier in 1922 in Kalkara at Danga. And then again, he, but at that time he was a young man, he'd been mar he'd married with young children. So he couldn't immediately get very much involved in helping Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati. So he had moved the business, he had moved to Prayag, to Allahabad, and then the Godiamat had come to his shop and they told him, we've opened a temple here, you must come, and, and then he, he told them that, yeah, I met your Guru Maharaj, I met him before in Calcutta. And then Prabhupada went on to get initiation, 1933. And at that time, when he got initiation, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada told him, he said, I want you to study this book, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. I want you to study it very carefully. It's very important. So it was an instruction which he got direct from his spiritual master. So Prabhupada took it very seriously. He studied it and when he got to America, of course while he was still in India, he began writing the Srimad Bhagavatam. But once he got to America, he, he also, he was able to get this Nectar of Devotion published. He'd been writing bits of it, and he completed it in the USA and he published it in the very early years of our movement. Actually, the first publishing was done by our own devotees. Prabhupada wanted the devotees to publish the books and the devotees printed it and published it. The quality was not so good, unfortunately. You know, the quality of the binding, binding was difficult, especially in those days. Anyway, but Prabhupada wanted like that, the devotees they could do these things themselves. So the devotees, that they, they did the whole thing. There was no computers or anything in those days. There was no typesetting, it was all done manually. But they published the whole book. So Prabhupada was very happy, it was an offering to his Guru Maharaj. And it was an offering to Srila Rupa Goswami. And Prabhupada writes in the Nectar of Devotion that the followers of the Krishna Consciousness Movement, they are considered Rupanugas. We are following Srila Rupa Goswami. So we are called Rupa Nugas. Rupa Goswami was the direct disciple of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and we are following Srila Rupa Goswami. There are many people who are devotees of Lord Krishna. Of those who are devotees of Krishna, not all are also followers of Lord Chaitanya. We follow Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, right? Lord Chaitanya is teaching us how to approach Radha and Krishna. And of those who follow Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, 
not everyone is a follower of Rupa Goswami. But in our line, we are Rupa Nugas, we are following Srila Rupa Goswami. And you will see the pranam mantras of some of our different acharyas. It mentions about Rupa Goswami, that he is a strict follower of Srila Rupa Goswami. So we are also followers of Srila Rupa Goswami. We are Rupanugas. Rupa Goswami, for instance, he established what is actual renunciation. Nirbanda Krishna Tambande Yukta Vairagya Uchate. That actual renunciation is to utilize everything in relation to Krishna. And false renunciation is to give up something thinking it to have no connection to Krishna. That is Falgo Vairagya. We re reject something. But we can use it for the service of Krishna. That is proper renunciation. We don't have to artificially renounce what can be used in Krishna's service. Just like sometimes some people, they say, oh, I won't touch money. There was a famous man from Bengal and he had a, some picture taken of him. Money was on the table and he would go like this, you know, that I won't touch it. And people thought, oh, very great man, very saintly. But Srila Prabhupada said, they should take a picture of me. He said, I will count the money better than the bank. <laughs> and I will spend it all for Krishna. So that is real renunciation. To use everything in the service of Krishna. We don't have to artificially give up things which can be used for Krishna's service. And this principle is taught to us by Srila Rupa Goswami. And we saw this personified Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, Srila Prabhupada's own spiritual master. He used to use things like a motor car. Now before that, any sadhu, any saintly person, they would walk everywhere. They would not ever think of going in the motor car. But Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati was showing the principle of renunciation. He would ride in the motor car and he would go to meet big government people and he would invite them to come out to Mayapur. <coughs> because at that time they were still establishing the actual legitimate birth site of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And it was very important to get some senior government people to come out there and see for themselves. So Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati would impress them by coming in a motor car. And then they would think, oh, you know, they think very nice if people got his own car. If you walk, if you, if you walk, they, they won't have so much respect for you. Just like in Hong Kong, one time Srila Prabhupada came to Hong Kong and the devotee there, the devotees there, they arranged Srila Prabhupada to stay in the penthouse suite of a leading hotel there in Hong Kong. And they also received Srila Prabhupada, they arranged one of the very top Indian businessman there, he had a Rolls Royce motor car and he agreed that his motor car could go to the airport and bring Srila Prabhupada from the airport to the hotel. So the different newspapers all picked up on that and they saw the Swamiji coming from India and he's in the Rolls Royce car and he's staying in the penthouse suite. So they all came to meet Srila Prabhupada and they were all curious that you're the, you're the sadhu, you're 
you're a Swamiji and you're riding in this Rolls Royce car and you're staying in the penthouse suite? And Srila Prabhupada said, yes. He said, if I would ride a bicycle and sit under a tree, you would not come to see me. <laughs> so, in this way Prabhupada was showing them how to apply the principle of Srila Rupa Goswami. The actual renunciation is to utilize everything in the service of Lord Krishna. And Srila Prabhupada followed the example of his own Guru Maharaj and his own Guru Maharaj was a perfect follower of Srila Rupa Goswami. We are also trying to follow in the footsteps of Srila Rupa Goswami. So Rupa Goswami went to live in Vrindavan on the order of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Previously, he'd been living in Ramakeli and he had been a very big government official, but he had now renounced everything material. He did not become a sannyasi, but he took what is what we would call Babaji, the Babaji vow. You can see the Goswamis, they're not wearing saffron cloth. Saffron cloth indicates you're in the material world. It's a material designation to wear saffron. It doesn't mean you're more advanced. It's a material designation. It's an ashram of the material world. Just like there is Brahmachari, there's Grihastha, Manaprastha, Sanyas. These are four ashrams of the material world. But those who are more advanced they're Babaji's, they're not, in the, not on the material platform. So Rupa Goswami, he took the dress of Babaji. They wear white cloth and they have not, the, the dhoti doesn't go down to their knees, but it, it doesn't go down to their ankles, it just goes to their knees. They have a shorter length dhoti, just wrapped around them, down as far as their knees. And in this way, they carry out a water pot, Kamandalu, and they, they will go and chant the holy name, sit and chant the holy name. Their, their mood is that of a bhajan anandi, whereas the devotees in our Krishna consciousness movement are gostavanandis, preachers, who are meant to be active preaching, but the Babaji's are bhajan anandis. Their attention is on chanting the holy name. And they will just chant the holy name all day and read the books, read the Shastra. And Srila Rupa Goswami, he would write Shastras. He, he and his brother Sanatan were both highly learned in many languages and they were writing beautiful Sanskrit verses. So Rupa Goswami wrote not, not only Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, but he wrote many other books like Upadesh Amrita, The Nectar of Instruction. Have you all read that book? Nectar of Instruction? Yes. Yes. Some people not read it? You have to get a copy? You have to get a copy, it's a very, it's not a big book, it's just a small book, but it's very, very detailed, a lot of important information is there in that book. And it's very valuable to read it and recite it again and again. We often try to memorize the different verses from the book Upadesh Amrita. The Nectar of Instructions by Srila Rupa Goswami and commented by Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. So Rupa Goswami also wrote two very important dramas, Lalita Madhava and Vidakta Madhava, Sanskrit dramas. 
Now when you write a Sanskrit drama, there are many rules to be followed. Different rules of grammar and then how the, the, the plot, the theme of the play and how it's all presented. It's a very detailed science. And Rupa Goswami, he he learned all of this and he wrote these dramas. He's describing the pastimes of Lord Krishna. One is the pastimes of Krishna in Dwarka and the other is the pastimes of Krishna in Vrinda. So they're very complex books. They're not easy books to understand. They're for very advanced devotees. But Rupa Goswami, he just tried to understand what an elevated soul he must have been. And he would write beautiful verses. Like the, he wrote one verse which describes the beauty of the name of Krishna. I won't embarrass myself by saying it in Sanskrit, but I'll tell you the English. It says, no one knows how much nectar there are in these two syllables, Krish and Na. When I chant the holy name and it enters my ears, I wish I had many, 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 many ears to hear the holy name. And when the holy name vibrates my tongue, I wish I had many, many tongues to chant the holy name. And when that holy name enters into the courtyard of my heart, then it conquers the activities of the mind and all my senses become inert. So Rupa Goswami wrote all of this in Sanskrit, in beautiful poetry. We are fortunate we have it translated for us by Srila Prabhupada. But those of you who like to read Sanskrit verses, you can learn these beautiful verses. And we have nowadays, we are training our younger children to recite so many verses. Sometimes I have the opportunity to hear the young children recite verses. And it's very nice. They learn from Bhagavad Gita, and then they go on to more difficult verses like in Srimad Bhagavatam and Chaitanya Charitamrita. So this is how devotees pass their time in Krishna consciousness, reading the books of the Goswamis and reciting these beautiful verses. Of course, we also spend our time worshipping the deity and Lord Chaitanya, he had requested Rupa Goswami to establish a nice temple to show deity worship. And Rupa Goswami established the most amazing temple in Vrindavan. Now if you go to Vrindavan, you may have already been there, the temple of Govinda. The deity has moved. The original deity of Govindaji was moved to Jaipur. What happened was Rupa Goswami established the temple there in Jaipur, but Aurangzeb was coming. You know Aurangzeb? He was, he was notorious. He would come and break all the deities. He, he didn't like anybody to worship the deities and he would go around breaking all the deities. So the people knew that Aurangzeb may be coming, so they were very worried. So they moved all the major deities from Vrindavan for safekeeping. They moved them to different places. And Govindaji was taken to Jaipur, because in Jaipur, at, at least 500 years ago, the Maharaja was a devotee. He was a great king and he was a great devotee. And even in Prabhupada's time, the queen of the Maharani of Jaipur was there. She was also a devotee and she met Prabhupada. Very nice. 
anyway, uh, Govindaji, for the safekeeping, the people of Vrindavan moved him secretly and they brought him to Jaipur and they put him in the care of the king. Of course, after some time, the danger was over and Aram Dev, he lived a long time, he lived nearly a hundred years before he died. But finally he died and after he died, then the people felt a little relief and they thought, we will bring Govindaji back to back to Vrindavan. So they approached the king that we want to take Govindaji back now. But the king said, no, no, no. He said, Govinda has come to my home. I cannot tell him to go. And so instead the king said, I am no more the king. Govinda has become the king. I am here as his servant. And that's how it was. And so Govinda is still there in Jaipur. And you can go and see the beautiful deity. Everyone in Jaipur knows Govinda Ji, Govinda. And it's the glory of Jaipur every morning, Mongo Arti, crowds of people go there to the temple and they sing and they sing and they sing and they sing wonderful kirtan. Every day, every morning, there are many people who go every day to see Govinda Ji before they do anything else. So this is another mercy of Srila Rupa Goswami, the mercy of Govinda Ji. And Rupa Goswami arranged also to build a temple and a, a, and a magnificent temple, an amazing temple, bigger than we can ever imagine. And they built it 500 years ago. Where did he get the money? He didn't bring any money. He gave his money away before he came, right? He'd given it away in charity. So he did not have any money. But Krishna sent someone who had a lot of money, who wanted to help him. And they built this wonderful temple, a magnificent temple. Very huge, it was so huge. And, and around there, when he had, the, they had built this huge temple, he was very angry. You know, they have the custom, you know, no temple should be bigger than the mosque. <laughs> they have that rule. In, in Malaysia, at least, they have a rule like that, you know that? That if you're building something, you cannot build it higher than the mosque. The mosque has to be the big. And so this temple was so big, Rupa Goswami had built this huge temple. So they came, they, were so, they did not like so they started to knock it. They reduced the height of it because it was so big. But still it's a magnificent temple. It's all stone, it's all very, very amazing temple very powerful. And this is the mercy of Rupa Goswami. So we have so much to thank him. He is one of our forefathers in the line of the disciplic succession. We are connected to him and we pray to him that we can continue somehow to follow in his footsteps and continue to distribute his mercy in the form of his writings and the mercy of Govinda Ji and all of the teachings which he has given. So these are some words in praise of Rupa Goswami. Maybe some questions are there. <coughs> If anybody has any questions, you can raise your hand. Clarify your doubts, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, uh, in, like, in two places I heard, there were only three brothers, uh, Amar Dev, Santosh Dev, and uh, Shivala. Uh, but 
But in another place, I heard that there were seven brothers and one sisters, one sister uh, of their family. So where did they hear that? It was in another lecture actually. So I just wanted to confirm like which sources. Yeah, there were three brothers originally. The three brothers mentioned in Chaitanya Charitamrita. Yes. One, of course, was the, the father of Jiva Goswami. So Jiva Goswami, his father was Anupam. Uh, Anupam left the body earlier. And Rupa and Sanatana, they retired to Vrindavan. But before they could get to Vrindavan, Anupam had already left the body. So I only know three brothers. I never have any with seven brothers. I don't know where it comes from. Thank So we present the nectar of devotion. Those of you who study Bhakti Shastri, if you take the Bhakti Shastri course, then we study the nectar of devotion and we also study the nectar of instruction. So very good for you all to study Prabhupada's books. And you can take these courses online or you may be lucky, they may have an on, on site here in Dubai because you have a lot of devotees here, either online or on-site, but you want to study Prabhupada's books. And the Bhakti Shastri course is very good for this purpose. You can study Nectar of Instruction and you study Nectar of Devotion, you study Bhagavad Gita as well. Very helpful for your progress in Krishna consciousness. So Srila Jaipataka Swami Maharaj, he's encouraging all of his disciples. He wants them to study Prabhupada's books. And especially you want to go on to second initiation, you must have studied Bhakti Shastri. And he himself has been studying and finding it very enjoyable. So we encourage all of you, if you have not yet studied Bhakti Shastri, you should do it. We taught it, I personally taught classes here before, we have many people, young people also taking the course. It's very helpful to your progress in Krishna consciousness. And then you, after you study Bhakti Shastri, you can go on and study Bhakti Vaibhav. And after Bhakti Vaibhav, then Bhakti Vedanta is there. And after Bhakti Vedanta, then you can study Bhakti Sarvabhoma. And then you can go on and initiate people. <laughs> They say for first for for second initiation you should study Bhakti Shastri. You want to take sannyas, you should study Bhakti Bhai Bhav. You no, know, the ladies don't need to take sannyas. <laughs> <laughs> Maharaj, actually, I had another question, but this is not related to today's okay. topic. Should I yeah. ask? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Maharaj, in Karma Yoga, what are the gradual pro progression? That has been discussed at the end of Bhagavad Gita. If you can just, in short, you can explain that. The karma Yoga means how it progresses. I heard the different terms like Karma Yoga, Karma Sanyas. Uh, so, how this gradual progression happens at this type in Well, yeah, there, there are two kinds of Karma Yoga Niskam Karma Yoga and Sakam Karma Yoga. Sakam Karma Yoga means with attachment. Sakam Karma Yoga. Karma Yoga is more appropriate for people in the beginning before coming to Bhakti. Probably we need to do Karma Yoga first before we come to actually do Bhakti. 
because bhakti yoga is at the top of the yoga ladder. So to prepare ourselves for bhakti yoga, we can we do karma yoga. Karma yoga means dedicating your work for the pleasure of Krishna. Often people are attached to work. Uh, you no, know, you like you like your job. You don't want to give up your job. You like this. so work. Keep doing your work, but give some portion of the fruit of your work for Krishna. Right? So, Nisakam Karma Yoga, you're working for Krishna and you give, you know, maybe a few percent, 1%, two percent of your income for the service of Krishna. And then Nisakam Karma Yoga is where you're more detached, you're still working but you're ready to give up more, much more of the fruit of your work for Krishna. Like we said, you know, 50% for the brahmanas and 25% for the family. Like that, you know, that, that would be more like niskam karma yoga, without any attachment. Below that, before that, you have karma kanda activity. Karma Kanda activities is what you get when you go to the Hindu temple. And the Brahmins are there. Mm -hmm. What do you want? You know, what, what's your desires? Oh, I need the new job. Oh, uh, we're getting married. You give us a blessing. You know, we do some Karma Kanda ritual. Or we, we have no child. We need a child. Help us get a child. And we'll do some function. We'll do some Karma Kandi function. So, Karma Kandi is a path of karma but with material desires. It's not spiritual. It's not spiritual. It's not on the yoga ladder. But it, it shows you have some faith, at least in Shastra. And your faith in the power of the Brahmanas and faith in the rituals. So you're doing some ritual. So that would be Karma Kanda activity. And then a bit above karma kind of you come to karma yoga. Karma yoga, yoga is to connecting us with the Lord, actually working for Him. But saka, with attachment. I have my attachment, I'm not ready to surrender yet, you know. So we're working but we're not ready to surrender. So that's saka. But as you're working for Krishna, you start to enjoy it. You start to take pleasure in the work. And you are enjoying it, you're getting bliss out of it. And then you become more detached. Niskam karma yoga. You get detached from it. But still you're doing karma yoga. Karma yoga in general, we don't know very much. You know, we haven't really learned anything about Krishna or who I am or anything like we, We're just working. We just like to do things. We want to do seva. We have that desire to do some service for the pleasure of Krishna. Just like some ladies come and they make flower garlands. Every day they'll come and make beautiful garlands for the deity. You like this? I got this garland. You know, somebody makes these things. You know, and that's a nice service to do for Krishna. And other ladies, they will come and cook for Krishna. They will cook beautiful dishes for. Krishna. Some people will decorate the deities. And of course, when the festivals come, like we're coming up to Janmashtami, we want to decorate the room and make it very festive-like. So there's a lot of activities there. You you may be doing all of these things, but you don't know anything of why I'm doing it, you know, and who am I doing it for? I don't know, I, I just like to do it, you know. <laughs> and so then you, but, but you come and then people start reading the Bhagavad Gita to you, that we're doing this for Krishna, that we're spirit souls, we're not the body, we're living in the body. But actually we're all spiritual beings, eternally part and parcel of one Supreme Lord. So we start to hear these, we get knowledge and spiritual knowledge is awakened in us. 
So that's Jnana Yog. And above Jnana Yog, then comes Dhyana Yog, meditation. We start to hear, to see the deities and we meditate and we see the beauty and we enjoy looking at the form of the deity. We start to meditate, remember the Lord, and we hear also His activities and His pastimes, and it fills our mind with thoughts of the Lord. And then comes Bhakti Yoga. Bhakti Yoga, where we are engaging. We have surrendered everything to Krishna, and we're, now we're working for Krishna. We decided, I just want to take full shelter of Krishna. So karma yoga is work and then surrender. You know, we're working and we give something. We surrender something. But bhakti yoga, we surrender first and then we will do everything for Krishna. We'll do whatever Krishna wants us to do without considering what it is. I just want to be engaged in Krishna's service. So you, there's a progression like that from Karma Kandi. Karma Kandi, actually we don't want to be bothered with that at all. Better to leave that. The Karma Yoga, the Jnana Yoga, the Dhyana Yoga, and then to Bhakti Yoga. And once you come to Bhakti Yoga, then you have to go on to hear more about what, what is your relationship with Krishna? Are you going to be in Shantaras, the stage of neutrality? In Shantaras, well, we appreciate the opulence of Krishna, but we don't do anything. We just, oh yeah, Krishna is very beautiful, but you don't do anything. You don't do any seva. That is santaras, neutrality, stage of neutrality. But above that, dasharas. Dasharas, Krishna's servant. I want to do service for Krishna. Maybe you can be like Daruka and drive Krishna's chariot. Or you can be like, uh, uh, like Patrak, and who is one of Krishna's servants in Vrindavan. He will help to cook for Krishna and he will bring Krishna his food and he will decorate Krishna, dress Krishna. So Dashara and above Dashara, Sakyara, become the friend of Krishna and play with Krishna. So Sakyara is still higher and higher than Sakyara, then Vatsalyara, become like the mother or like the father of Krishna. Parental love. The parents take so much care for their child. And even higher than Vatsavya Ras, you have Madhurya Ras. And in Madhurya Ras, they have that deep love for Krishna. And there's different kinds of Madhurya Ras. There is Parakya Ras and Swakya Ras. Swakya Ras means really conjugal love with marriage. With marriage, there's some love there, but Parakya Ras is without marriage. Without marriage, you know, it's more exciting, right? <laughs> After marriage, it's not quite the same. Before, before the marriage, there's a, an excitement in there. So Lord Krishna enjoys with the gopis in Parakya Ras, the mood of the gopis. And among the gopis there's many different gopis and they all love Krishna, but among all the gopis there's one gopi who is exceptional, who is the most dear to Lord Krishna. And of course that is Srimati Radharani. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and all the devotees, they follow in the footsteps of the gopis. Gopi Bhartu Parakamalayor, Das and Das and Das. Right? Follow in the footsteps of the gopi. And of all the gopis, the foremost gopi, Srimati Radharani. 
So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu comes. He wants to experience that Radha Baba, that love which Radharani has for Krishna. Very, that is the highest love of any love. It is described in the Shikshastikam. Where Lord Ch the final verse of Shikshastikam, it, Lord, uh, it is said, Even you handle me roughly by your embrace, or make me broken hearted by not being present before me, you are completely free to do anything and everything with me, but you are always my worshipful Lord, unconditionally. Krishna is the same. Lampata. Matpranadatastu. Right? Lampata means a womanizer. Lord Krishna sometimes associates with other ladies, you see. So Srimati Radharani, when she hears that Krishna is associating, oh, my, she's thinking that my relationship with Krishna. But she said, even you make me broken hearted. You are my worshipful Lord, unconditional. This is love of the spiritual world. We don't know this kind of love, right? No woman will say, if, if my suffering makes you happy, that is my happiness, my dear Prabhu. <laughs> No wife will say that today, you know, but this is Srimati Radharani. She said, if my being unhappy makes Krishna happy, that is my happiness. They just want to make Krishna happy. That is the highest one. Okay. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj, for the wonderful class and it was so elaborate. And I'm sure all of you are clear their doubts to a great extent. In case you still want to read that Maharaj, you can let me know. We is already available on emails and I can clarify your doubts. So thank you, Maharaj, for this wonderful class and uh Hare Krishna Mantra again. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama. We had got a news yesterday that His Holiness Bhakti Vikas Swami Maharaj has been slightly detained in Russia during his travels now because of some change of rules. So we also pray for him and uh, his uh, assistant who is along with Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. We'd like to also pray for His Holiness Jai Prakash Swami Maharaj who is recording in Mayapur. Maharaj is slightly better but still not uh, ready for flying. And also for all the Prabhupada disciples who are travelling around, I, I will see a video of His Holiness Mahavishnu Goswami Maharaj also. He's now I think nearing 80, uh, 77, 80. He, he jumps around like a 14 year old boy. <laughs> but sometimes I heard he was not well also. But we pray for all the disciples you put. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And we love to pray for the host, uh, Vishal Prabhu and Mataji, and uh, Tiamati, and uh, Shrey, and all the family members, uh, yeah, Vajay Prabhu and uh, Anjali Mataji. <coughs> we are all the old timers of Shamanji, one of the first uh, cell members we wish to have, and their altar also is one of the old timers. <coughs> Some this two I went. <laughs> Any girl one? You made this? No, no marriage. Uh, I wanted to have a marriage. Marriage. Okay, we'll try to pray for the whole family and they will be. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. I think the birthday of Rasishwari Matthews. Where is she gone? She is actually the kitchen. Okay, she's hiding because she's not a real king. Okay, we'll put a play for the good head of Rashid Mahdi. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare.
my prayer request for my mother because she is having a cyst problem okay. right on the rib cage. So, okay. so she what is her name again? Uh, Sandini Devi Das. Also, praise for recovery for. Uh, uh, we have Sandeep Prabhu at the back, good wife Karim Maharaji and his son Kesho had been operated. So we also pray for the recovery. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Any other prayer requests anybody has? There is the next session. Uh, so, Mahdi and children can come and take Prasad from Maharaj. Yeah? Bro, can you make some space, bro? You can just make some space so that you can come to Mari and Chilin can come. Take the Satan Mara. Rashika, come, come, come. Mara has to go for the next program. Are there any new devotees here from the first time? Please raise your hand. Yeah. 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 What's the name? What's the name? Ravi. Ravi. And what one are you? Ravi. 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 Thank <laughs> you. 